Isaiah 64. We'll read the whole chapter together. Um, and in this case, by the way, this is the prophet who's speaking by way of prayer. Uh, if you remember, this is the closing of our Advent series. Um, and so he became their savior through the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah chapter 64, we'll read the whole thing this morning. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. As fire burns brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down, the mountains shook at your presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you, who acts for the one who waits for him. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are like righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up, to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look. We all are your people. Your holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful temple, where our fathers praised you, is burned up with fire. And all our pleasant things are laid waste. Will you restrain yourself because of these things, O Lord? Will you hold your peace and afflict us severely? First Baptist Church of Grey Gables, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures. Let's go to the Lord and thank him for his word. Lord, these are the honest words of, of a prophet. Lord, a man that you called thousands of years ago, who saw the destruction of Jerusalem, who saw the dislocation of your people, made a byword among the nations, and all this because you seemed you were perceived to be a God who could not deliver nor keep his promises. You seemed to be a God who was inactive and indifferent to his people. So Isaiah cries out and asks, Lord, will you restrain yourself? Will you keep silent? Will you afflict us so terribly? And we're left at the end of this chapter with that question just hanging in our minds this morning. So we thank you that you have definitively answered those questions. And Lord, we look forward to hearing the answer in our time together today. So please give us your help, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Again, if you're a guest of ours this morning or you're visiting today, uh, we're coming to the end of a five-part Advent series of Christmas, speaking about uh, the coming of Jesus into the world, particularly from the book and the prophet Isaiah. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of where we've been already, uh, we've looked at Isaiah 1 and the need for a Savior, how we're in desperate need because of our sin and rebellion against the Lord who created us for a Savior. Then we saw promises for a Savior. The Savior who would have a worldwide domain, the government would be on his shoulder. He would keep the promises of God. He would bring peace. We saw his work would include sacrifice and resurrection from the dead, but also the bringing about of a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells and his people wait for. Last week we looked at the appearance of the Savior. We looked at that 400 years of silence between the Old and New Testaments how there was a prophet, there were angelic beings, of a vision, of miraculous birth of a virgin and a barren woman, sign after sign, a star, wise men from the east, this declaration that the Savior, the Messiah has come. And so we're concluding this series this week, looking at Isaiah 64 under the title, Waiting for the Savior. Because we are now in a time where we have seen the arrival of our Savior, but he's gone back to heaven He's ascended to the right hand of God, and we are still left in a broken, fallen, sinful world. We are waiting yet for a Savior to return. Amen. So Isaiah 64 tells us of that longing. It's, it's really the believer's prayer for God to come and fix things. 
Because we are between the first and second coming of the Lord Jesus. So we can pray this prayer. And there's, there's so much that's really applicable to us as long as we wait for God to act. And we long for him to act. The reality is when we think of the return of Christ, we could, we could both identify with the fact that we struggle in this time. We struggle with faith. We struggle whether he's really going to do anything. Is this all a mirage? Is this just a myth? Is it really true? Is Jesus really going to come into the world? We haven't seen him yet. Yet we love him with joy inexpressible and full of glory. But there's a, there's a lot of people we know who believe things that are just flat out false. So, so how do we know that this is not a false hope? How do we know that he's really coming into the world? How do we know this won't just spin out of control until the human race destroys ourselves by apocalypse or nuclear war? How do we know that this isn't just fool and folly? Well, Isaiah answers some of those questions for us. And what I'd like to do is simply break down this passage into three sections to see what his answer is. First of all, I want us to notice the prophet's longing. In verses 1 through 5, I'd say 5a, we see the prophet's longing. Remember who this is. This is Isaiah, and he is, he's speaking to the Lord here. This is his prayer. This is his longing for the presence of the Lord. He says it in this way, verse 1. He says, oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down. See, see, the picture right now is of a God who is far off. This isn't the sense that God is near, present, acting, that he is with us. This doesn't feel like Emmanuel. He's up there in heaven. We dwell in the earth. He's separate and disconnected from us. So we want him to come out of the heavens and do something. All of this wreckage, all the problems that we're facing in the fallen world, they're just continuing over and over again. Marriages struggle, divorces happen, people die, disease happens, injustices are done. And Isaiah's attitude toward the whole thing is, I know how to fix this. I know how things will be made right. It's going to be when God rips open the heavens, as it were, and comes down like a mighty warrior, rending the curtain of his room and just bursting in the scene. Then things will happen. Notice how he describes it in verse 1. He says that the mountains might shake at your presence. Now, probably speaking here, both of physical mountains, yes, but also the mountains that represent kingdoms and armies of the earth and Verse 2, he says, what's that going to be like? As fires, verse 2, burn brushwood. As fire causes water to boil. In other words, judgment will come. Righteousness will come. And what will happen when he does that? To make your name known to your adversaries. That the nations may tremble at your presence. See, there's actually a part of us that kind of riles up when we hear stuff like that, right? We go, yes. That'd be so great, wouldn't it? Just for, for God to come in and kick the rear of all that's evil, bad, and wrong. So all the nations who do not know him nor love him, that they might tremble in the presence of the Lord. That would be awesome. He sees this and he says, that's what's going to end this. That's going to be the fix to the problem here. That's what's going to bring about this, this majesty, this glory, and this righteousness. And then he recounts what God has done when he's done this before for Israel, because God has done this for Israel time and time again. So verse 3, he says, When you did awesome things for which we did not look, you came down, the mountains shook at your presence. Of course, we know he's speaking of Mount Sinai, right? When God came and met with his people after rescuing them from Egypt. In verse 4, he then says, This is something that should happen because of who you are, O God. Verse 4 says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you, who acts for the one who waits for him. See here Isaiah is confessing his faith that, that this is the God who has entered into human history in the Exodus, in the trembling of the mountains, and now in this brokenness we're waiting and we long for you, O Lord. You promise you are the God who is going to act on our behalf and we wait. Because you act on those, he says, who wait for him. And then verse 5, you meet him who rejoices and does righteousness. The person of faith is the one who, who looks to the Lord, who what he will do in the future, and says, I believe you are coming. But until you come, 
you know what I'm going to do, Lord? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and work righteousness. I'm going to go ahead and do what's right. I'm going to live according to your law, according to your holiness. I'm going to do it not as one who's just dragging their feet as if obedience is a burden, but joyfully obeying and working righteousness. This is the one who God meets, who joyfully works righteousness. And then continuing on in verse 5, he says, who remembers you in your ways. So, so here's kind of the shape and sketch of the man of God, of Isaiah. Right? What's he doing? He's waiting on the Lord because God is going to act for him. And until then, he's joyfully going to work righteousness and remember God in his ways. And so there's this longing for his presence. But he also recognizes, as we see in the text, that, that when God comes, when the Lord comes, judgment is going to happen. When he makes his name known, justice will happen. Perfect goodness arrives. What happens to that which is bad when perfect goodness arrives? Well, what is bad is destroyed. What happens to the hateful when perfect love arrives? All that is hateful will flee away. What happens when perfect beauty enters into the world? All that is ugly will be cast away forever. And so what happens when he arrives? He rends the heavens. He's not, by the way, a divine bully coming in and saying, all you people who didn't worship me, I'm really angry with you. I'm here to set things straight and bully you because I'm a divine oppressor. No, here's what makes him so terrifying. What makes him so terrifying is that he is perfect love. What makes him so terrifying is that he is perfect beauty. What makes him so terrifying is that he is perfect goodness. And what makes him so terrifying is he is perfectly true. So all that is hate, all that is ugly, all that is evil, and all that is a lie flees away in his presence. That's why the nations tremble. Isaiah knows when God comes back, not as the divine perfection of everything that is good, beautiful, true, and holy, things can't remain as they are now. The reason that they are as they are now is because God isn't present. Now, right there you hear that and you say, okay, theological bells are going off a little bit, right? We know God's omniscient, He's, um, uh, he's omnipresent, He's omnipotent, and so... In one sense, we know God, God's always present. one sense, we know God is present everywhere. But there is another sense where he isn't present in those places at all, or else they would not exist. So, so this manifest presence that he and the people of God are waiting for, are praying for, those who are joyfully working righteousness and remembering his ways are longing and anticipating their, for that day of perfect truth, beauty, and goodness. It arrives. His glory and his name is made known in the earth, and that's what causes everything that is opposite of him to flee away in terror. Just as the lights came on in this room this morning, when the lights come on, darkness cannot be present, correct? That's what happens when he returns, friends. When he comes, his action is in response to all that is in enmity with all that he is. It's why things can't remain the same. But, but there are people right now in and some of them are in this room, I'm sure, who are waiting that day with joy, who are working righteousness and anticipating him to come. And so that's what Isaiah wants God to do. He looks and he, he sees Israel. He sees the brokenness, the enemies, the injustice, the unrighteousness, all that is sinful. And he says, come back and rend the heavens. Come quickly down so we might shake at your presence. But then... Then he sees a dilemma. That's the second thing I want us to notice in starting in 5b. I'm sorry, I, I hate to break it there, but the, I think the verse number's wrong there. It should, it, it should be start at 6 right there. You are indeed angry. There's a, there's a turn there. But we see the prophet's dilemma. Immediately in the second part of verse 5, let's say, it tells us of a problem. It says, you are indeed angry. For we have sinned, which 
which brings the problem home. See, the problem is not out there with all the evil people, is it? The problem is with us. You were angry and we sinned. In these ways, we continue. So, so in light of God's coming again and, and causing everything to flee away, that is the opposite of who he is, he makes this statement. And we need to be saved. Why? Because we are part of the problem. It's, it's not just the people who do the evil things. It's not just the unjust and unmerciful. Isaiah says, we are part of the problem. The darkness is in our hearts. The sin is embedded in us. And the question is, if you come back now, Lord, will anybody be saved? Verse 6, he goes deeper in this description. He says, but we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are like filthy rags. I don't know about you, but for years I read this verse incorrectly because I heard that, that all of our righteousness is but filthy rags. Paul reiterates this, of course. But, but in my mind, that just means that no matter what we do, we still have sinful things. But that's not what he says here. He says the righteousness we do compared to who God is in his righteousness even the one, even the one who works joyfully in righteousness awaiting the Lord, if we take it in and of itself and give that true work of our righteousness in joy to God, it's like a filthy rag. It's like a leprous rag. Our righteousness is defiled. Not just our sin is defiled. Our righteousness, we think, oh, our sins are bad, but, but my righteousness, the things I do from a pure heart, that's... That's good. No. My righteousness is even bad. My righteousness is spoiled. And not only that, we're so frail. It says we all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Death comes by way of consequences of our sin. And then he, he looks out and he asks the question. He says, who are those who really call on your name? Look what he says in verse 7. And there's no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you've hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Again, notice, us, we, our. And so, do, do you see the dilemma here? You see the, the tension that he's cranking down on? Verses 1 through 5, we go, yes, come Lord Jesus. And then verse 5b and following, we go, oh no, <laughs> Verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you our potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look, we all are your people. See, now what he's doing, he's actually speaking of the consequences of sin. Uh, he's going to go on to talk about it even more. The earth was destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed because of Israel's sin. And as soon as we say, aha, well, you know what? At least we haven't destroyed the earth. We'll just look around. <laughs> like, look at our city. Look at our neighborhoods. Look at the world. Mankind has not ceased destroying ourselves. Have they? We still bring what is dark and evil. We lie, complain, groan, steal. There are all kinds of consequences. So not only is Israel unrighteous, but remember, Israel is always a picture, a microcosm of all of humanity. So us in and of ourselves, we are unrighteous. Not only has Israel brought great consequences on their great cities, but we as a human race, we've brought terrible consequences on our cities. Everywhere we go, from just pollution to whatever cause you want to go, there's, listen, I, I know it's going to sound political, but, but there's legitimacy that we're not very good stewards of the resources of planet Earth. You know that, right? It's a fact. Whether you're liberal or conservative, we don't do a very good job in a lot of things. That's not a political agenda. It's the fact that wherever the human race goes, we abuse the stewardship of creation. So there are consequences. Verse 10, he lists them. Your holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. 
We look at many parts of the world now and there's desolation that comes as a result from our sins. Verse 11, our holy and beautiful temple where our fathers praised you is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. We look at the earth after the Garden of Eden where there was, there was once no death, no sin, no pollution, no enmity, no war. And now what do we see? We look around and there's war, enmity, hatred, fights, broken marriages, rebellion. It's funny, we've been... Um, my mom and, as, as, as the Bible and audio, um, and I've got to use all these illustrations of my kids before they get in here and listen to the sermons because um, that's the time to do it. Uh, and Emmett, um, Emmett loves listening to the Bible on audio. Uh, he just, he soaks it in, right? Um, so he, he listens to the first three chapters of Genesis and he's just locked in. Just the, the days, the numbers, he gets it. But then he asked, he asked his Gigi the other day, he said, Gigi, can you skip that part with Cain and Abel? I don't like that part. And I thought, well, you're right, you shouldn't, right? Because there's a, there's a great shift from Genesis 1 and 2 to Genesis 4. We go from paradise to fratricide in a couple of chapters. How did we get here? This is what we see. The human race abuses all that is good. And here's where he closes his prayer. He says, in light of who God is, in light of the mess we've made as the human race, when he returns, what are we going to do? We all need to be saved. We've, we've covered that, but, but shall we be saved? And then he asks the Lord this question in verse 12. He says, will you restrain yourself because of these things, O Lord? Will you hold your peace and afflict us very severely? So, okay, you feel the dilemma here? It's a dilemma. That's, that's a problem, right? The longing for God to come and kick evil out until we realize that evil is in us. That's, that's what, what is ugly in the world is us. What is hateful in the world is us. What is destructive in words and selfishness and self-centeredness and narcissism is us. If God comes back and deals with us as we deserve, we're all in big trouble. But we need to be saved. So shall we be saved? Because yet we also feel the sense of this is not the way the world should be. We even feel the sense that this is not the way I should be. Who will deliver us? So this is the dilemma. Do I want God to come back and deal with this or not? And then we start thinking and asking questions like, well, if he is coming back, how am I going to be right by then? How am I going to get right by then? Which brings us to the third point and probably the simple answer that you're all thinking and knowing, right? The resolution is Jesus. That's, that's the, the answer. The resolution is Jesus. The resolution of this whole problem is Jesus Christ. It's what this book preaches to us. It's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us about. He is the resolution to the dilemma. He is the one who is coming. He is the one who is resolving this sin problem. All of my righteousness is filthy garments. So what do I need? I need a righteousness that is outside of myself. I need a righteousness imputed to me. I need his righteousness. I need all of my debt paid, all of my unrighteousness washed away. Because if not, if God deals with me as a person outside of the person of Jesus Christ, it's over. I'm done. I will be part of those who know the name of the Lord, his truth, beauty, and goodness, but I will be destroyed by it. I will flee. Because Jesus is the only one who resolves the sin problem. He's the only one who also resolves the God problem. Remember in verse 7, he's, he's hidden his face from us because of our sins. What did Jesus do? Jesus goes to the cross so that God will hide his face from his son. He'll cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He could not see the face of his God any longer in that moment. But he did that so that we would never be forsaken by God. And he would never hide his face from us because of our sins again. He comes to resolve the sin problem. He comes to resolve the God problem. But he also resolves the heart problem. Because the issue here is this is sin that comes out of our own hearts. And, but what's Jesus going to do? 
He comes to give us new hearts. Hearts that desire him. We heard that in the testimony this morning, praise God. Hearts that love him. Hearts that long for him. Even with remaining sin in the mixture of what remains, there is a longing and a joyful waiting on God to come in his power. But he's also the one who not only resolves our sin problem, our God problem, our heart problem, he resolves the, the city house worship problem. Because there are those consequences. There is a, a holy city, a holy temple. What happens to those who get involved with them? They get destroyed. That's the story of the Garden of Eden, right? Where God is present in his temple, in the garden. The story of Israel, where over and over again the people sin against the Lord and he flees that temple. It's our story. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit and yet by our sin we cause him to be grieved. But it's Jesus who, who comes along who resolves that because he is the true temple of God. He is the righteousness, the one who will gather to himself all people. We gather to him for worship. We come to him. He is our Mount Zion. He is our sacrifice. He is our everything. All of these problems, all of these dilemmas that put at such tension with us and such angst with us, Jesus comes and says, I'm the solution. When it comes to your sin problem, I resolve that. When it comes to your problem with God, I resolve that. When it comes to the problem within your own heart, I resolve that. When it comes to the consequences of sin, I resolve that by the way of worship. So in answer to the question, how then shall we be saved? It all hinges on this issue. What do you have to do with Christ? What do you do with Christ? The question is, is he your sin problem? Or are you still trying to resolve your sin problem by your own righteousness? Are you still trying to solve your iniquity problem? Because it's a problem. <laughs> we still sin. The question is, how are you trying to resolve that problem? It's been said, and I think this is true, there are two wrongful ways to deal with our sin problem. One is what we would call an irreligious approach, which basically says, I don't need God, spirituality, religion. What I'll do is I'll find a cause, whether it's the rescue of puppies or world peace or social justice, recycling or other things that are look good things. But what I'll do is I'll make that cause my functional savior. And when I do that, and I'm faithful in it, then I'll feel some sort of sense of purpose and relief and guiltlessness that I've, I've done something to help save the world. It, it, it really is a form of self-saviorhood is what it is. So, so that's, an, that's an irreligious form of self-righteousness. But there's a religious form of self-righteousness as well. This is the one we probably all struggle with. There's a form of self-righteousness that says, I believe in Jesus, but the guilt isn't actually dealt with. The, the guilt in relationship with God, in relationship to, to those guilt feelings, it's not dealt with. But listen, Jesus is the resolution to that. There is this religious way of self-righteousness which says, I know that I'm in good standing. I know it. And I know I can be free from the sense of guilt. But I do that by the fact that I do certain things. That's what makes me free of guilt. And, and when I don't do certain things, the guilt continues to heap up. I do it in the name of Jesus. I do it in the name of the Bible. And I do it in the presence of the church. But, but church, the biggest problem in the church is self-righteousness. And even this kind of self-righteousness. By that, I mean someone who's trusting in their own ability, in their own righteousness. Their feelings of guilt and acceptance go up and down depending on performance. Friends, hear me. That will damn you just as much as irreligious self-righteousness. Leaning on that is leaning on a broken stick that will pierce your hand. Leaning on self-righteousness of any form, self-atonement, self-flagellation for the purpose for trying to atone for your own sins will not atone for a single one of them. Hear me, Jesus is sufficient. He is all. There is no guilt to pay for when you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't damn yourself by self-righteousness trying to be your own savior. By torturing yourself through overworking to try and prove your worth to your spouse or to somebody else because I have to do something to atone for my mistakes. 
My answer is no, you don't. Jesus has sufficiently done that for you, and you can't add anything to that. And, and hear me, friends, that's good news. Amen. It really is. It's a news that God wants to use to, to liberate you. Because God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Believe in him. All your sin is resolved in him. He's the reason you can approach God. Not because you're worthy, but because he's worthy. He's a high priest. You know what high priests do, right? They give sacrifices for sin and they intercede on behalf of sinners. So by way of application, brothers and sisters, it's another simple one. I've tried to get very simple applications for you throughout this series. Thank the Lord for His solution in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the application. Yeah, listen, we do this year in review stuff and we act like years alone have autonomy. Not nah, time doesn't have any autonomy. What are you talking about? Like 2022, somehow as a segment began and end in some sort of way that it's collective. And we judge based on whether it's a good year, whether we have much to be thankful for. Friends, you recognize you could just have Jesus and that's your year in review. <laughs> in fact, some of us could really afford to just look at our years in review based solely on how well we loved and served Christ. Lord, where have you brought me from this year? Lord, how much more like Jesus have you made me in your righteousness throughout this year? Lord, what are some ways I can, I can look to grow, to worship, to grow, and to serve this year? So we just simply say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your solution the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one better, no one more righteous, no one who can reconcile us to God but him. So we thank the Lord for his solution in Jesus and the fact that we are new people in his creation. What's one of the ways we can know we are those who have been resolved in Jesus? You remember back in the Old Testament where I said, as they long fully awaited for the Lord, what did they do? They began to joyfully work righteousness. That's what we do. We begin to joyfully work righteousness. Knowing, yes, that that righteousness does not atone for a single sin. But working righteousness because we desire to be more like him. Working righteousness as a fruit and evidence that we truly are thankful for the gift of his righteousness he's bestowed upon us. We begin to wait for him. We begin to long for him to fix what is broken in us and in the world. We recognize, yes, there's still sin, brokenness, and fallenness. But that's why we're waiting for him to come. And until then, what do we do? We joyfully work righteousness and we remember his ways. And as we think about this, and particularly what we find in this passage, I think it's important that when we engage in non-Christians or with non-Christians, maybe you're here and you're a non-Christian this morning, let us affirm the human complaints against everything that is wrong in the world. Let's, let's affirm that. right? So, so when they say, we don't like that this happens and that happens, What's very interesting is that people get really angry, particularly when you talk to them about the Lord, and suddenly they go from being frustrated with the world to angry with God, right? Well, if this God exists, why doesn't he do something? We can point them to Isaiah chapter 64 and say, my friend, you are not unlike the prophet Isaiah. What do you mean? Because the prophet Isaiah, man of God, he had the same questions that you do. Well, how's that? He saw the brokenness, the problems in the world, and he longed for something to be done about it. He asked the question, will you restrain yourself? If there's a God, why is he keeping silent? Why is he afflicting us so terribly? You're just like an Old Testament prophet. They'll go, what? See, God's people have had these questions. You can be a believer this morning and have those same questions. You may have things in your life where you ask that very same question. God, why are you restraining yourself? Why are you keeping silent? I wish you would just come back and deal with everything. But the question to ask is, if God came back apart from grace, would you be saved? See, the grace you want, is that the grace you want for others? So, so in that, engaging in non-Christians, I simply affirm, if, if you're here this morning as a Christian, non-Christian, you, you feel that angst, that tension, that dilemma, I just say, 
Welcome to the reality of longing for justice, righteousness, truth, beauty, and goodness. But, but certainly, let us use this also to affirm when engaging with non-Christians to say, I know somebody who knows exactly how you feel. His name's Isaiah. Bring him to the scriptures. And then lastly, don't forget this part. Tell them of God's solution to those problems. <laughs> Let's not affirm the human complaints and what is broken, what is wrong in the reality of human sinfulness alone. Let us tell of God's solution to the problems. Because it's in that context that the solution will make sense. And as we do that, we we wait for him and we joyfully work for righteousness. Let's remember his ways. You you say, okay, well, we asked the question at the beginning, how how do I know this isn't a myth? How do I know this isn't just wishful thinking? There's this whole philosophical argument that discounts Christianity because it's, it's just wishful thinking. How do I know that he's really and truly returning, coming again? You want to know how you know? Because of Christmas. <laughs> because of the historical reality that he has already come. <laughs> That's what makes Christmas so important. It's what makes the incarnation so important. It's what makes the 500 eyewitnesses and the apostles so important. It's already happened. And so we conclude this Advent series as we do that. May the Lord give you some of the joy in the midst of suffering, joy in the midst of great disappointment, joy rest in a sense of being settled with God in the midst of brokenness. And yes, that will make us pray for grace, for His mercy to be extended, but it will also make us look up. And be watchful for the time when the clouds will be rolled back as the scroll. And the heavens will be opened. And he who is truth, beauty, goodness, and the light of the world will come and make all things well. Paul makes that promise, doesn't he? To the sufferings you feel and I feel, to all the disappointments, the anger, everything you feel because of what's wrong in the world. All that, that suffering he says, what does he say? It's not even worthy to be compared to what's to come. We feel that now. But church family, the time is coming when your present sufferings, your present disappointments and frustrations will seem like a whiff of air that came for a moment and immediately vanished. You will be in the presence of perfection, holiness, goodness, and you yourself will be part of the divine glory. Not becoming a God, but being glorified in Him. You will know nothing but unending, uh, unceasing, expanding, and perfect joy, beauty, goodness, and righteousness, and you will know it for all eternity. All the stain of sin will be wiped away from the human experience. And for that reason, for that reason alone, if you're not a Christian here this morning, I urge you to trust in Jesus today because that's what you get. And for those of us who are in Christ, may we look with anticipation and work with joy in the midst of hard circumstances now as we await our Savior's arrival and return. Praise be to God. Would you stand and join me in a word of prayer this morning? Lord, if if we're honest, these these things seem too good to be true. Um, If if you were not a God who could not lie, the truth is we would not believe them. But you've sworn by yourself that these things are indeed true, and yet we still struggle to believe. So Lord, simply would, would you help us to believe? Lord, would we long for your return more and more as we see the day drawing near? Would you help us to extend grace to others as we proclaim your gospel to the nations? Father, would you help us to joyfully work righteousness, not to rid ourselves of any feelings of guilt, because our guilt was nailed to the cross of your Son. Father, our guilt was destroyed, and now we live in joy. That's the reason we can joyfully work righteousness. Because we desire to honor you, bring glory to you. But ultimately we recognize that our very best apart from Christ is nothing but filthy rags. But you have given us the righteousness of your son. It's what the cross means, Father. Not only have you taken upon yourself our sin, but you gave us the righteousness that Jesus has earned in our place. 
so that by repenting of our sins and believing and trusting in the finished work of Christ, we, we can be looked at as righteousness, even though we are far from it. Father, you take our filthy rags and you make them white as snow. So we say thank you. Help us to live lives that reflect that thankfulness as we joyfully work out righteousness. Help us, Lord, to obey you. Lord, help our attitudes in the midst of this coming year to, to think on spiritual things. To give us hope in the midst of a, a wicked and crooked world. And to long and await for your day to come. And while we await, Lord, let us be about proclaiming your word to everybody we meet. We ask for your help in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this hymn of reflection together. Church family, as we come to the time of our invitation, we pray that the invitation is very clear um, as it was given in the, in the sermon itself. If you are not um, belonging to the Lord Jesus, if you're a non-Christian here this morning, then uh, would you recognize that all the brokenness that you see and experience in the world, um, the longing to fix that apart from you being reconciled in Christ would end in your destruction. The only way that you can be saved is to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you have questions about that and the process of that, certainly we want to answer those. We want to be here for you. We're going to walk through what it uh, means to be a Christian. So if you have questions, if you want to respond to that in faith this morning, if today is the day you want to know that you've been made right with Christ, then please, we'd encourage you. Um, I'll be down front here. I'd love the opportunity to talk with you about Christ this morning. Uh, join us. We'll pray together. We'll stay as long as it takes to, um, to see what's going on with you and see how we as a local church can help and minister to you. And for us, church family, uh, never forget, um, never forget the gift of righteousness that was given to you. The guilt is done away with. Now we get to joyfully work righteousness as we await and long for our Savior to return. Do you long for Him to return this morning? Yes. I tell you, I've said it time and time again, the older I get, the more I long for the Lord Jesus' return. Maybe you're a young person here and, and you, you're like me when I was a young person and thought, you know what, I'd, I'd really like to, Lord, if you could just hold off, I'd, I'd love to get married. That'd be, that'd be pretty cool, I think. And he's allowed that and he's been gracious to allow that. Uh, praise God. I was very unmarriable. Um, but <laughs> joke's on you. Tricked you. Um, no, um, stuck with me now. And Lord, let me, please let me have children. Uh, and then, then maybe. But I, I recognize um, the best thing that could happen for my children, my wife, and for me is for the Lord Jesus to return. Even, even before I knew them, <laughs> got to experience the beautiful love and life that we have together. Ultimately, the greatest thing that could happen for the Christian is for Christ to return. Amen. And that will be a joy that will be incomparable with even holding your own children. That's, there's no greater joy in my life than being able to, to love my family and walk with them and, and be with them and to hold my child. But the joy that's awaiting us, friends, that won't even compare. And that sounds nuts, doesn't it? But it's true. What a gift of grace in the gospel we've been given. So we long for that day and we await it together. And while we do, we work joyfully in righteousness. Praise God for his mercy and grace.